it's like something out of science fiction. Unsettling transformations are sweeping across the planet. And clue by clue, investigators are assembling a new picture of Earth. They suspect we've entered a time of faster global change than any human being has ever witnessed. But we can rise to the challenge, alter the course. It's up to all of us to confront these strange days on planet Earth. I don't claim to be a psychic, but I know precisely what comes to your mind when I say the word ocean. You're thinking of two things, the sand between your toes and the seafood on your table. That's not mind reading, it's opinion poll data. Even though the ocean covers most of the planet, we hardly give it a second thought, but maybe we should. You may have heard that most of the world's fisheries are not what they used to be. That's no fishtail. 90% of the big commercial species like tuna and swordfish may already be gone. Does it really matter if strange animals that you hardly ever see except on a plate are in a tailspin? Well, the answer is surprising. You see, there's more to this story than just the fate of your dinner. That's because most of the actions we take make ripples. Chase and capture a fish, for example. You might trigger a cascade of events that you never dreamt of. Follow a fish and you can end up in some unexpected places. This is a tale that starts in the distant bush with a biologist's troubling journey. When Justin Brashares began his field work, fish were the furthest thing from his mind. His concern was the grasslands that were eerily devoid of life. Where were all the hippos? The leopards, the hyenas, and wild dogs? What about reedbuck, dikers, the giant warthogs? And if this was Africa, weren't there supposed to be lions? The disappearance of animals was striking but one savanna dweller was oddly bucking that trend. Olive baboons were roaming Ghana's parks like marauding armies. Throughout the countryside, baboons were conducting nighttime hunting raids, something they had rarely done in the past. Troops terrorized farms and ravaged livestock. I think for very poor farmers like the ones in Larabanga, it's a real problem for them. On day-to-day -day basis as to when are the animals coming. Marauding baboons, disappearing wildlife. What's driving these transformations? And you might also be wondering, what could these phenomena have to do with fish? Brashares would ultimately make this connection and his investigation began when he opened an old wooden door. I think the first time I walked in, I was just entirely blown away. It was kind of a holy grail, unlike anything else we can find on the planet. Since the 1960s, members of Ghana's Wildlife Division have been gathering meticulous data on weekly patrols. Here were hard numbers that helped explain the scarcity of wildlife. Elephants had declined by 70%. Hippos had dropped by 50%. But perhaps most alarming of all was the decline of large predators. The lion population was down 80%. Free from predation, the baboon's population not only shot up, they also felt safe enough to hunt at night and over time became more aggressive. While the records helped to explain the rise of the baboons, what had happened to all the other wildlife? 
There's been much speculation about bushmeat hunting being the primary cause of wildlife declines in, in many protected areas. Demand for bushmeat from Ghana's exploding population triggers daily battles. On one side are the hunters, struggling in what can be an ungenerous land. On the other, the rangers, who try to ensure that the animals in the parks survive the growing human threat. The Wildlife Division chronicles these encounters, and they've found that hunting is so intense, it's a major driver of animal declines. But the records raise another question. So when we look at the long-term trends, we see dramatic decreases in wildlife populations associated with general increases in hunting activity in parks. But when you look at a smaller time period, intensity of hunting from one month might be very different from the month that follows what's happening in communities that's affecting the behavior of, of hunters. For shares would find the answer to this question quite by accident and far from the bush of Ghana. Back in North America, Brasheres attends a lecture by the former vice president of Ghana. During his lecture, he points out that fish loom large in the Ghanaian economy. Fish are also a staple of the Ghanaian diet. So a scarcity of fish can reverberate throughout the society. So as he was talking about how important fish were to the system, my brain, you know, the little rat started to run on its treadmill. And I thought, I wonder whether or not these dramatic variations in fish supply might explain or might have something to do with the variation that I see in, in hunting intensity. When you take that year-to-year -year data on fish supply and you plot that on your graph, and then you bring over the year-to-year -year changes in wildlife populations in Ghana, you see that the two match up almost perfectly. So in order to really try and understand whether or not supply of fish was in fact driving hunting of wildlife, I needed to get into local markets. We went each week during market day. What we found was an amazingly direct relationship that seemed to be overwhelmingly driven by fish supply so that when fish were in good supply, they tended to be cheap, and people bought huge amounts of fish with relatively small demand for bushmeat. When fish became more scarce, it became more expensive. People overwhelmingly turned towards bushmeat. Brasher suspects that the relationship between fishing and the slaughter of wildlife is not confined to Ghana's borders. He thinks this link is a key factor driving the disappearance of wildlife throughout coastal Africa. With the stakes so high, what can be done? Ghana's fish stocks today are half of what they were decades ago. And with a tripling of coastal populations, both fishing and hunting pressure will increase. One of the biggest obstacles is far from Africa. European governments subsidize factory fishing fleets to work distant waters. Without such incentives, fishers could not afford to work so far from home. But there is some good news. In Europe, politicians are rolling up their sleeves with the World Trade Organization in an effort to pare back fishing subsidies. And the rest of us can join the battle against overfishing in the aisles of our supermarkets. Labels like these certify that a fishery is being managed responsibly. The need for all of us to act is becoming more urgent because the effects of fishing aren't confined to Africa.